Hello, everyone. I hope you had a great lunch. So this is room two, and we're going to have a talk on what is our ethical obligation to ship secure code. So if this is not what you were expecting, now is a good time to head to room one. Uh, we will be uh, hosted by Alyssa Shavinsky. She's CEO of Faster Than Light, and she's building developer tools. She previously launched Everyday Health, which was an IPO, Geek Corps, which was acquired, and Brave, which was a 35 million ICO. Her focus is on bringing security best practices earlier in the development cycle and building tools to make it easier to ship secure code. She's also the author of Lean Out, published by OR Books. So just a few notes before we start. This is going to be a short-ish presentation of 15 minutes, and afterwards we'll open the floor. I'd just like you guys to be mindful of the code of conduct, which was exposed this morning. If you have any questions about that, you can reach out to any of the volunteers in the room. And with that, thank you, Elisa. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you. I'm really pleased to be here at NorthSec, which is, as uh, most of you probably have seen, such a special event, like a real community event, an event that brings together uh, different points of view. And I'm really pleased to be giving this talk in particular. Uh, this is my first time giving this talk, which I made just for this event. And I think it's uh, a little bit unique to NorthSec to be willing to host this conversation and ask these questions. I think we can agree uh, it's pretty important right now. Um, and I know this is a privacy conscious audience, uh, so I want to invite you to please tweet this talk. Um, niceness is appreciated, but it's certainly not owed to me. Um, my handle is Elizabeth on Twitter, and I'm seeing folks tweeting under uh, NSEC. Uh, oh, I got that wrong. Um, so that'll be wrong throughout the deck, 2019. Not NSEC 1919. <laughs> uh, and to open this up and to quote the good place, what are our obligations to each other? Many reasons why ethical conversations are in the air these days, not the least of which is its infusion in pop culture. A uh, bit of a hat tip there to utilitarianism. What is good? What is bad? What does Aristotle have to say on all of this? Or better yet, what are the obligations of companies towards users? It's a better question, right? I think we should ask what we're obligated towards each other, and that's an important conversation. Code of Conduct uh, nods towards that. But really, what are the obligations of companies towards users? We really need to understand and examine this. I think about this a lot as someone who is CEO of a company, but I think uh, whether you're an employee or an individual developer, there's a lot to think about there, and certainly if you're on Twitter or Facebook, you've thought about perhaps what they owe to you. I've certainly given that thought. There is a $100 million class action lawsuit filed in Calgary over a massive data breach from Marriott Hotels. And I thought their claim was interesting. The defendants knew, or ought to have known, that their databases were vulnerable to loss or theft. How about that? Maybe they are obligated because they knew and they failed to protect appropriately, or if they didn't know, perhaps they were obligated to know. Perhaps they should have known. Perhaps you should know better, and if you don't. And I pose this question to some people who I think of as ethical and moral authorities. I said, what, what do companies owe us? What do they owe us? Terms of service. <laughs> what an answer, right? Terms of service is like the minimum possible obligation that a company has to the, the users. And clearly, there's some legal obligations there, but I mean, Agree, view terms, view terms is like, do you even view the terms? Raise your hand if like you really read terms of service. I'll read them sometimes as a curiosity. Like maybe I, I think I'm gonna go back to the company and, and complain. Um, Spotify had some privacy issues that bothered me and I, I wrote to them um, and had a conversation and. I think I read the terms of service at some point in the middle of being a customer. Um, but it's widely understood we're not reading terms of service. Much less widely understood 
is that the companies can change the terms of service and it's retroactive, right? So like terms of service can hardly be the barometer for what companies owe us. And what's more, terms of service isn't an ethical thing, right? Like it's just a legal obligation. It's the minimum legal obligation and we're trying to have a conversation. I'm hoping to have a conversation today about something beyond the minimum letter of the law. And my hope as someone who runs a company is that I'm going to do better than just the minimum. Uh, and I had promised in uh, the talk proposal to talk about different schools of thought, right? You've got Kant and Rawls and utilitarianism. And if anyone here really wants to do a deep dive into frameworks, you know, ethical frameworks and foundations, uh, I am professionally, not professionally, I am academically trained in that, and I am here to have those conversations, but I just kept coming back down to the golden rule. Uh, you know, it was really simple to me. I don't want to get hacked. I don't want to get hacked. And security people, privacy people, tend to feel that about their own data. You don't want to get hacked. And because you care about this, because it's a value for you, you want to take care of this for other people. Uh, so, you know, we're going to open the floor in a little bit, and I am very open to the idea that, you know, maybe I've um, made too many assumptions about where everyone's coming from ethically, but uh, it's my guess that this is the moral framework guiding a lot of us. That, you know, we don't want to get hacked. So, you know, we feel obligated towards that protection, and also, I don't want to get hacked. And I imagine that the executives at these companies don't want to get hacked, and so they should be doing this for me, right? Like Jack Dorsey doesn't want to be hacked, and Jack Dorsey doesn't want to be harassed, and so he should be able to you know, make that leap and say that he should do the same for the users. Uh, that's probably why there was a lot of talk when uh, Mark Zuckerberg had some features that not all the users had. It was like, well, he has these features. He has the ability to unsend a message, so clearly he understands that's valuable. Why doesn't he extend that to everyone? And then they did. Um, to Facebook's credit, uh, they actually do have some responsiveness. So I'm just saying that a lot of these companies could do better and that laws can be changed and laws aren't ethics. So what should companies be obligated to do in terms of shipping secure code, protecting user data, and responsibility for their platforms. Uh, and I thought that this is an interesting opportunity. We're all here together. We care about these things. To open it up a little bit, um, I have a story that I'll want to share after this. So this isn't the end of the part where I stand up and talk. Uh, but I'm going to step away from the laptop for a minute. And let's open this up. Um, really, what do you think? What do you think the obligations are? What are companies' obligations to be shipping secure code? Clearly, clearly companies are not shipping the most secure code that they could be, but they're following their terms of service. I don't think this is okay. Um, and if you have opinions on this, I'd really, let's hear it. Thank you. Uh, if you'll say your name. I'm widely known as J-Bash. From the FBI, no less, okay? No, I'm not from the FBI. <laughs> I am not impersonating a U.S. federal officer, which is probably illegal in Canada, too. Yes, yes. So the, I'm, I'm glad we clarified that for the record. I'm interested in why you choose to cast this in terms of companies. If I were a real engineer doing real engineering, and I designed this room, and it fell on people because I screwed up, I would be personally held responsible. Yes, yeah, so that's the next question, actually. <laughs> uh, thank you. To, to our next point. Um, there's, there's the responsibilities that corporations have, but corporations are just made up of people anyway. And so I think it can be kind of easy to look at companies and say, well, companies have these legal obligations, but the decisions aren't made by companies, they're made by individuals inside the companies. Even though those decisions are made by, you know, people sitting around a table, it's the board of directors, it's three or five or seven or, you know, some number of people. Uh, and a lot of us in this room are either individual developers or pen testers, we fall somewhere along that spectrum. So I think that's perhaps um, an even better question and one that is more appropriate to those of us in the room. Um, 
As for individual liability, I don't know, right? Like that probably depends on the contracts that you sign, which again is a legal question, but ethically, if I designed this room and it fell on people, I would feel bad. <laughs> uh, so let's keep it going, please. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Goldberg. Um, and I think that, you know, just following up on that, I would feel bad. <laughs> um, I've noticed that a fair number of people actually do say, well, it isn't illegal. Or what I exactly. did was lawful. And they somehow pin their view of what's ethical to what they can legally do. That's I, right. I have a legal right to be an asshole, but I hope That's I'm right. not. That's right. Uh, and uh, I think um, if there's one point that I really have to share, and it's one that uh, I believe is widely shared in the security community, but that we could discuss more and talk more and bring more out into mainstream awareness, it's that tremendous difference between what's legal and what should be. Uh, and it's legal right now for companies to ship code knowing that it's insecure, or rather like knowing that they haven't done everything that they could to secure data, to secure their processes, all of that could be legal, you know, and then the marketplace, you know, a lot with companies is fiduciary responsibility and that's legal um, and that's very real. You, company executives have what's known as fiduciary duty. They have to make some money for the companies. They have to put making money first. But you can ship secure code and still be successful, still make money. Um, and saying it was legal is obviously not good enough. And if it is good enough, we're able to change the laws. This is in a moment right now Certainly in America, maybe also in Canada, other places around the world where people are making really big changes in laws. Uh, I think the abortion law that people are talking about in the southern states in the United States is a really good example, a very big legal change that's happened without even a lot of support necessarily. Um, and so just because something's legal doesn't even mean it's permanent. It's legal today. What if we all decide we don't want it to be legal anymore? You know, things, things can certainly change. Yes. As a counterpoint to what you were saying, um, particularly from a small business point of view, CEOs, in the sense that they are CEOs when the business is still that small, are looking to get yeah, a I'm product. Yeah, I'm not exactly a CEO. It's just <laughs> are looking to get a product to market and beat their competitors and see that, hey, if we can cut some of this security, the engineers provided a proof of concept, it works. Let's get it out there. See if anybody wants to pay for this. Right. And then once we have money, we can fix it. And I think often, too, you know, the, the fix comes a little late, but uh, th they're looking to get something out there. They're looking to actually have the money stop, I don't know, using their personal savings or whatever they're using to, to fund the company early on. And it, it's seen as um, a, a fairly dramatic overhead to... Right, anyway. it's considered a high cost thing to uh, be secure as a startup. Um, with all of my startups uh, since at least 2013, we just deleted all the user data. We said, okay, we're a really small company. We're not in a great position to protect everything. And one of the talks that I gave a lot over the last few years was doing security for startups. And if you just don't hold on to user data, that can be a really good way to manage. Like, just don't hold it. If, if you don't have the capability to protect it, like just don't hold on to it. That's been my take that said, uh, I definitely understand there are a lot of startups and they just don't have that protection. I had a friend who wrote to me and he said, please try my product. Uh, by the way, don't use an important passcode because there's like no SSL on it. Like there's nothing good that you need on any of this. And I actually wasn't mad about that. I was like, okay. He has been transparent with me, and I know what I'm signing up for. And so I think that's also a model that, from my point of view, is reasonably ethical. Like, we are shipping a beta product to our users this week at Faster Than Light, rather next week, this week, next week. 
And um, we're just going to be really clear about the status of the product. Like we, we actually have pretty good security because we're security people, um, but it's a beta. And we're just being really clear, like here's the things that are edge cases, here's the stuff we haven't tested really well. And so I think some measure of transparency, the problem is people ship stuff, you have no idea what the security is with tools that you use and people just, a lot of founders, there's an attitude that it's just okay and that it doesn't matter, uh, but then there are consequences for people down the line. And so it's mostly an attitude of not thinking through or caring enough about those consequences, which I'd argue is a problem. This is probably a good moment. I have um, a story that I wanna share, story time. I've been working in the blockchain space and I saw something just wild. I saw something that I've never seen as a security person anywhere else. These are all screenshots from what's known as an audit report. Everyone in blockchain security knows the word audit is the wrong word to use, but we've been using it, so we just call it auto report the way you do when everyone just agrees to use the wrong word. Um, and it's, it's wild. Before companies in the blockchain space, especially Ethereum, but also EOS, also other parts of the blockchain ecosystem, uh, they get a pen test report before they ship code live. It doesn't matter how big or small the company is, and companies will come to me, they're like, we don't have any money. We'll give you tokens, we'll give you equity, like we need an audit report. Like we don't have any money and we're not gonna go live without a report, we're gonna find someone who will do it for us. Um, and oftentimes I was like, well I have to pay people. So, you know, we only do work for money because I have to, I pay people with money. Um, if I can find people who like will work for not money, then I like, okay, great, but, um, <laughs> but but it's to show this the seriousness of this um, in this one area. Like why? Why is it that even these tiny blockchain startups are insisting on like really good security? What happens with the auto report are like really great developers, uh, like the folks from Consensus who are doing a workshop tomorrow, uh, folks from Trail of Bits, uh, we're building on top of a tool from Trail of Bits, they're wonderful. Um, they go in and they actually review the code, uh, like line by line, uh, and using static analysis tools. Uh, and then they send in fixes and the companies have to make the fixes. Or else it goes in the audit report that the code has vulnerabilities and they ship the code like that. Nobody wants that. Um, they all want the audit report to say that they did a good job. Um, and so we all come together, all aligned around, like we're gonna do static analysis, we're gonna read the code, and then you're gonna fix the code. It's amazing, it's like a security person's dream, right? It's, it blows my mind. Uh, why did this happen? It happened because investors, mostly investors, and there were a lot of regular people who were able to be investors in the blockchain space because of the way the token sales worked, because of the way all the crowdfunding happened. Um, they just insisted on security. They just insisted on it. Uh, and so I think there's a bit of a lesson there for those of us who want companies and individuals inside those companies to take security more seriously. It's like, well, uh, if enough of us come together as investors and as customers and say like, hey, this is really important, this matters, um, it can make a really big difference. Uh, pose for the photo. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, go back. Um, I'm gonna talk for a few minutes and then open it back up around developers. In general, we're in a really special moment. You know, um, I remember when I first started, like 20 years ago, uh, you would show up to work and you didn't get to choose what tools you used at work. Just like you showed up and like this was your work station and you logged in and you used whatever tools they gave you. And then you went home and you like, didn't get work calls, <laughs> very different. Um, and these days, you know, it's like two in the morning and I'm slacking with my team, so there's a price we pay for where we are. Um, but on the other side, we're really empowered. You know, you show up to work, you just decide whatever tools you wanna use. And you can also decide that you wanna pay a lot more attention to the security of your code. Uh, so I think we get to ask right now, who do we wanna be? What do we wanna create? 
Is it our job to ship code without vulnerabilities? I think this is a real question. It's a question I don't have an answer to. Um, can we rely on QA and pen testers? I don't know, maybe. Maybe not, maybe it depends on your organization. Maybe this is a really personal decision, uh, but I think it's worth asking. And I also just really like this slide, so I wanted to include it to be the best version of you. I came across this image as I was looking for the other ones. So unless someone has something very strong to say about developers and developer ethics, do we have a hand? Because we can keep going on this, otherwise we'll switch gears. Yes. So maybe this should be saved for later discussion, but I want to bring it up after your story. Well, and I'll be around um, okay. after Norman's talk. Uh, okay. I'm going to stay, and I encourage everyone to stay. Uh, but just so I can yes. make the point, but not get into the discussion. Uh, with that story, I was wondering whether people were aware of the conflict of interest that offering tokens in what they're auditing would do. And the second thing is that the is that what you were kind of suggesting there was, at least in this case, the market works. So the market actually does work um, if customers and investors are empowered about it. So let me go back to where I uh, put the wrong handle there. I'm very human. We have to forgive each other these things, but then fix them and correct them when we can. Uh, so that's my handle on Twitter. Um, so feel free to tweet me over that, and then we could have that conversation a little more publicly because those are interesting questions. Um, and I also want to give a shout out uh, to Norman who came over and we spoke before uh, and I think um, the talk that follows in this room and if you stay in this room, the conversation will continue I think a really useful way. What are the responsibilities to protect users from harm on social media? This came up recently uh, with the viral video um, that wasn't shut down quite so quickly on social media and there seemed to be a lot of consensus around the idea that it should have been but I think a lot of these questions are not obvious. They certainly haven't been discussed at length. Um, and how does this fit into traditional security and threat modeling, right? Like, is this something a red team should be doing? Like, who should be thinking about these things and when? Um, and since this was also part of the proposal, even though it's a bit of shifting gears, I think it's important when we ask what are the ethical obligations from these companies? We're, it's like very heated right now. You know, President Trump, recently uh, in the United States released a form. Uh, he called it a tool, the White House called it a tool. It's not a tool, it's a form. Um, to fill out if you were silenced on social media. Like this is an issue that is really heating up. The White House has taken it on as something that really matters. Um, but I think the answers are really non-obvious. We need to be discussing it as a community. So with that, let's open up the floor.